and welcome back to the Movie Pope podcast. And today we've got another great guest. We have Simon Rubenstein. You're on the show. And you might find this a little bit odd, but this episode is airing right after New Year's. But we're recording right before um, the, uh, Christmas and New Year's holiday. So things are a little bit petty wampus, but you know, we're going to roll with it because that's that's how we are on the show. Um, but before we dive in, remember to like, comment, subscribe. And as always, thank you so much for watching this episode. And let's go ahead and dive in. Simon, my man, how are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing excellent. Thanks so much for having me. And welcome to the audience. We're recording tonight on my birthday, so it's extra special. I'm so happy to be here and share a little bit about what I do making movies. Well, I was going to say, Simon, um, what's funny was that um, was that a few weeks ago, my birthday was on a Monday, the 27th. And I did an interview with Zach Reiner. He um, he used to work as a production assistant until he became a beekeeper. So <laughs> that was actually one of the funniest conversations I ever had on my birthday. <laughs> well, just... happy birthday. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, and happy birthday to you, sir. Um, so Simon, um, you're a you're you're based on New York, is that correct? Yes, Brooklyn Heights, downtown. Gotcha. So I've I've always been curious. Is it really as hipster as they say it is? You know, because <laughs> well, I've heard the uh, stories, but it's very, very you know odd being amongst the hipsters sometimes. Luckily, my neighborhood is very residential, not at all that sort of vibe. But some of the neighborhoods, you know, I have trouble getting into. It's such a scene, you know. I have to bring my beanie. <laughs> I like that. I like that uh, little touch right there. Um, so Simon, let's go ahead and dive in. Tell us, um, why don't you go ahead and start off and just tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and you know what you know what made you decide. You know what, I'd rather be doing this instead of being a stockbroker or you know working for the DoD. I love that. Yeah. So I'm a filmmaker, director, producer, cinematographer, editor. Uh, I am also a manager. I manage one of the top cult classic writers of all time, Joseph Ritter, who wrote The Toxic Avenger in '86. The remake's coming out by Legendary Entertainment, starring Peter Dinklage, Kevin Bacon, and Elijah Wood. Oh, oh yeah, I saw that. I saw that, by the way. <laughs> I uh, thought it was fake at first, because it was like, they're not really re doing another one, are they? But, I, you know, but apparently it's, you know, according to IMDb, it's, it's the real deal, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're really excited about it. I also own a rental business, a lighting, camera, lenses, audio. We rent mostly to students and to filmmakers with disabilities. I work full time in the motion picture industry on shows such as West Side Story, Russian Doll, and just like that, Sex in the City for HBO and uh, Insidious Five. We had a lot of fun over there. And I also own my own marketing consulting firm. I've worked with companies like Nike, Paco Rabanne, Joey Badass, just to name a few. And I have a long history in broadcast, filmmaking, documentary and other commercial ventures so i'm having a lot of fun you know we love being on set we love making movies making laughs you know we're not doing brain surgery luckily so we get to have fun i started uh really getting the bug for it when i was eight years old my parents and grandfather bought me the matrix box set and i just watched all the behind the scenes and i, I thought wow these people are having so much fun and they pay you what could be better so um so, so so you started off with watching you know the entire Ma um you know the matrix box set did um was there anything that you're doing in your personal life or in school that kind of you know kind of gave you the um the exercise to kind of warm up your filmmaking skills anything like that yeah, for starting in 2010 i worked on a broadcast show for about six years the steve Katzo show in massachusetts uh i started as a, a set utility set director and I produced the live show, and then I worked as a steady cam utility and then a cameraman for about 100 episodes. So it really gave me a feel for the broadcast environment, which is a little different than filmmaking and television production. You know, live action is fun, but, you know, I did the VMAs with, uh, let's see, who was there that year? You know, Kim K, uh, Rihanna, Beyonce. Nikki, Drake, they were all performing. It was a lot of fun. The hip hop honors for VH1 as well. Uh, and, you know, I did a lot of sports, the NHL Winter Classic for one. But for me, broadcast is so rewarding, but you plan and you plan and you plan, and then the show runs itself. Whereas in filmmaking and television, you can really have a lot of fun with it and you can really make something that will last forever. 
Well, I was going to say, because when it comes to broadcasting, there's a certain order to all the chaos. Whereas with filmmaking, it, you know, depending on the filmmaker, there's like this, you know, you sort of have to, I mean, sometimes you have to micromanage whether, you know, whether you want to or not. Is that, is that a true saying? Would you, would you say? Well, um, I, there are so many sayings. The one, ones that I like are, you know, we plan and then we plan, we plan. So when we get on set, we have the freedom to improvise. Mm -hmm. and really about you know finding the scene you know having the right talent in place and really letting everyone do their job you know it's such a collaborative environment you know these hundred million dollar productions with hundreds of crew members you know it's fun everyone's really nice to each other gotcha got i mean i mean it's completely different from what you hear on the outside where everybody's just you know so cutthroat and bitchy you know <laughs> i mean i i, 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 mean, I, have, to, I have to say because you because you hear those stories you know <laughs> right you know, certainly on the lower tier projects, you know, TV, uh, lower tier television, you know, it, it can be very cutthroat, uh, especially in some of the departments in it. But when you get onto the higher scale, larger productions, you know, everyone's just there to have fun, really, and do their job. Right, right. It's like a community, um, you know, that they end up building. Because I remember, t I remember talking to, uh, interviewing one guest um, earlier this year. Um, she used to work on the Marvel's Miss Maisel, and she was telling me how, you know, she ended up building a community where they would come and help her out on her own individual indie projects when they weren't um, shooting between seasons. So that's pretty cool, man. Um, so, so, so you worked in broadcasting for six years. Where did you, where did you go after that? Like, what was the next stepping stone for you? Uh, yes, after that, I went uh, to uh, undergrad bachelor's of fine arts at NYU Tisch School of the Arts, where I graduated with honors uh, and studied film production, of uh, uh, large format photography. Irish history. I concentrated in cinematography and directing. Uh, and, you know, there I really got a feel for working uh, on set uh, more in a dramatic sense. You know, there was one semester where I was taking three production classes, and I think for 130 days straight, every single day I was on a different set uh, doing anything that involved content creation. So, you know, I really honed my skills. I worked with a lot of actors. New York's a great place uh, to find talent because that's where everyone goes you know there's a million restaurants for all the actors to work at and you know there's uh opportunities all around uh you mentioned marvelous miss mazel i did about a week working with them and it is a really really nice environment you know everyone's very friendly so yeah. when i uh, i was at nyu and that's where um i met my uh, business partner uh, joseph ritter i was working on a student film and we actually met on a street corner if anyone knows brooklyn it was uh, clinton atlantic so uh, I gave him my business card. We chatted about a month later. And then uh, we've been working together for eight years now, uh, doing content development, writing, creating stories, and really having a lot of fun. So when you were at NYU, um, and, 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 I'm really, and I'm really, really excited to, to chat about this because you're the only other guest so far who's actually gone to film school, besides myself. Um, what um. Did you develop like a, like a certain predilection or a certain uh, I, I guess um, you know direction towards a particular genre or a particular style or were you just you know whatever whatever goes man I'll I'll just go with it. I love that you know when it comes down to it you know the audience is bored you know life is very difficult you know so they want to be entertained you know they want action adventure drama romance you know that's what gets them out of the house so for me. Uh, I really express interest in all, all aspects of the process. You know, I really got a feel for becoming a storyteller in the non-film classes that I took. Uh, I studied with Professor Thomas Trucks at the Irish House, where I learned all about the early modern period of Irish history. I took a performance art class with Karen Finley. And, uh, you know, I learned that, you know, no one can really anticipate how anyone else will perceive your work. So it's really important to make clear choices and strong vision. I took a life, a few life drawing classes where I really got a sense for, you know, palette and color and artistic vision, uh, art history, of course. I was able to study and, and, you know, look at the greats. I took a semester in Florence, Italy, where I really spent a lot of time every day in the museums. So, you know, when I want to storyboard or to come up with a palette for a film, you know, I decide what paintings I like, what artists really give me a strong vision that relates to what I'm trying to convey to the audience. And the rest is so simple because it's all right there in front of you. 
Right, right. They sort of like lay the foundation. You kind of build build off from that. Yeah, all film is homage. You know, there's no cinematic technique that hasn't been done before. So, uh, you know, and even in the past, they were copying even earlier techniques. So for me, you know, it's all about paying an homage as well as, you know, respecting what's come before and finding a way to tell a story. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, you know, so while you were at NYU, you, you know, you, you met up with Joseph Ritter and the two of you developed a, a friendship and a partnership. Can you, um, can you talk, can you talk about, you know, you know, what, you know, what, pro what projects, you know, you were doing when you first started out and what were the, you know, what were the things that you learned and the mistakes that you made that you, that you feel like is very important to impart on those who are uh, up and coming, want to get into the business such as yourself? Yeah, great question. You know, I think first and foremost, you know, you have to take risks, you know, you have to try everything so you can really get an appreciation for what you do, what others do and what you don't like, you know, I'll never be, uh, you know, as good of a director if I didn't first learn a different craft and have respect for those people that you collaborate with, because when it comes down to it, you know, everyone's there to convey your vision on set. Um, you know, there's different reasons people go into different crafts, but it really is an inclusive process. So I think one of the most important things that I learned is that, you know, it's never too early to start expressing your vision. And you should always, you know, be doing multiple things. You know, I shoot a lot with the camera. I direct a lot with the actors. I constantly post casting notices. And, you know, I find that the more you search, you know, the more people are willing to, you know, come along uh, for, whatever endeavor you're doing you know i made a great project a tv pilot hostile takeover we had so much fun making that and then shortly after that when COVID hit you know we said nothing's going to stop us don't let anything ever stop you ever you can't there'd be no point so we did a, a show called my new girlfriend a lgbtq romance drama where we actually had um actors from around the world in germany and brooklyn and uh, Italy and Mexico that we were working and collaborating with and you know we were all writing and, sh and filming together on zoom and things and then recently uh, you know during when the writer's strike started you know we said okay what can we make that doesn't have any actors and there's no script and we made a brilliant uh, sports documentary called total football about soccer fans which is good, doing uh, really well right now I can't exactly go into all the details but you know we have a lot of really exciting things on the horizon for that. So I would say, you know, even in school, you know, it's, uh, you know, my friends, you know, they needed help uh, doing lighting or something, you know, and I know a lot about that. But, uh, you know, when I was first starting out, you know, you, you, you have to dive in, you know, you have to experiment with every lens, you know, with every camera, you have to know what you like and what you don't so that you can make these strong opinions and have, you know, um, when you're making decisions, you have to know what your opinion is and why it's strong. And if you're a director, you have to have the answer to every question immediately because you don't want to waste anyone's time on set. So it's a skill, you know, you have to be able to live with every choice you make. So that decision has to be instantaneous and you have to know the right answer. And, you know, it's a skill. Right, right. And and, and it's one of those and, and it's one of those skills where you kind of have to, like, learn on the fly, but you kind of. You know, but you know, but as you make make your mistakes and as you kind of you know learn from other people, you kind of build on it until you figure out what your style is as a director. You know, of course. So, um, so can you talk to me? What was it? What was it like getting started, um, in in the film industry? Because, you know, you know, because you worked in broadcasting for six years, you went to NYU and you you know worked on a lot of projects. What was it like when you were, you know, on your own for the first time? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're a total newbie and it's your first day on a hundred million dollar production and they're telling you you have to jump in like a 80 foot condor with 14 100 amps of power running up the arm and you have to you know uh play with these big lights you know the eighteen thousand watt light you know and you're used to just you know dealing with you know 150s or something <laughs> I mean, it, it, can be, it can be really intimidating but you know um for me it's always just about having fun you know if i am there wow, you know, that's a pretty remarkable place to find yourself. You know, you're working at the cutting edge. I remember I worked for two days on the blacklist. I was still in college. I think it was season six. It was the pool sequence. 
I watched it just the other day. It was so cool to see. You know, we shot six hours into lunch. I think I walked away with like three thousand dollars after uh, taxes in two days, and I had never seen that much money before. So, you know, it's you have to be there for the right reasons, right? So, you know, I'm always there to learn, even if I'm in the museum, you know, looking at an exhibition, you know, I'm there to learn. I'm there to see how I can take a piece in and respond to it. They say painting and drawing is all about making a mark and responding to it with the next mark. So it's constantly this back and forth with what you're creating. You have to constantly be checking in, you know, now that I've done this, I'm going to do that. Now that this is done, now I can move on to the next step. Um, you know, I think 2001 A Space Odyssey, that took them two and a half years to shoot that film. It, it just goes to show how much work goes into something uh, so quick. You know, it's there in the blink of an eye. It's gone in a second. So you really have to have an appreciation for it. And I learned from a very young age that, uh, you know, soak it up every chance you can to be on a set big or small take it and learn and a lot of times if i'm working with students these days you know most of their crew has no experience and that's a lot of fun too because you know you, you can really show them the tools uh you know and help them really tell their story okay so so so, so do you teach or do you just like do a mentor pro um, program or, or or what yeah, I do a lot of mentoring. Um, I, you know, rent out, uh, you know, the FX9, the FS7. I have these um, film cameras as well, the Airy 2C. So I'm constantly meeting new people. There's a big alumni network. Um, you know, um, you know, if there's like a, a set on the street, you know, that's that's a New York thing. You know, they're always filming. But um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you just have to go and introduce yourself. Let me think. Last week right around the corner in front of key foods for anyone who knows the neighborhood they're filming the new kim kardashian season of american horror story so of course uh, i happen to know the craft services coordinator i happen to know the location manager we all work together on sex in the city so uh it's it's a really fun environment and it's a much smaller community than you'd think so anytime you see anyone you know even if they have their one light and there's like four people grouped around it they're staring at it um and they have their little DSLR, you know, it's interesting, you know, and it's worth going and introducing yourself. So, I mean, I mean, that's just so fascinating because, you know, because all, of all the people, all the people I've talked to this year, they've pretty much said the same thing that you're saying. It's a community. It's, it's, it's a really, really small community. Um, you know, cause you know, cause a, a dummy like me, who's looking from the eyes that I'm thinking, wow, there are just so many people in there, but it's like, you know, when you get in, everyone's like, oh yeah. Hey Joe, how's it going? How, how are the, how are the wife and kids? Oh, okay. I'm sorry <laughs> to hear that. Um, so, so, so I want to, so I also want to ask you next, are you, um, are you working on any, any major projects right now? Or is it kind of just been like a slow thing because of, because of what's been going on with the strikes, you know, first with the writers and then with the actors for the past few months? Uh, yeah, I can't exactly go into too much detail, you know, NDAs and whatnot, but okay. since the writer's strike ended, uh, we, you know, our content development company has been, you know, showcasing our work out there and we're having a lot of positive response. So, you know, fingers crossed, you know, we'll see what comes in the new year. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, so just our curiosity has, um, have these, have these strikes affected, affected your production, like in a huge way, or has it kind of been, you know, a, a bit of an inconvenience, but not nothing too big. I think it's been the most exciting time in my whole life. Um, you really? Know, okay. Oh, of course. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, we were working on a show for Apple TV called B4 with Billy Crystal. We worked until day 65 of the writer's strike, and then we shut down due to um, pressure. We were at Sustainable Studios in Monaki, New Jersey, mm -hmm. after coming off at nine months at uh, Silver Cup Classic in Queens for Sex and City Season 2. So, uh, yeah, you know, it was interesting, uh, you know, because with that not happening with um you know my sort of day-to-day uh, -day work i was free to really dive into you know my content development company and we created what i think is you know gonna be the best most watched sports documentary series that there's ever been total football so we had so much fun you know because we own all the equipment we own all the lights we own all the cameras the lenses the audio equipment you know, you don't need 
a, a crew of 20 to make a project. You just need a strong vision. So we started um, going to pre-production on that. We, you know, we made a bunch of calls. We, we decided, you know, where we wanted to go, who we wanted to see, what we wanted to film. Uh, we were talking with Red Bull Arena, and then we decided that for the pilot episode, we just wanted to have a bar, a local bar in Brooklyn. We went to the Monroe, and we filmed uh, the Liverpool FC. I think it was the opening game of the season, and we just had so much fun there. You know, everyone was so warm and loving and just wanted to tell their story, and that's what documentary is all about. You know, we have about 20 projects we're trying to sell right now, about 10 television shows and 10 feature uh, screenplays. And then now we're tipping our toe into documentary just because that's what was around us. You know, we didn't want to do anything with actors. We didn't want to do anything with writers, even though we are writers. We wanted to stand in solidarity. So instead, we put our thinking hats on and we just did what came naturally to us. We made something. Gotcha. That I mean, I, I mean that, that's pretty ingenious because... You would think that with you know with everybody on strike, there's nothing to do, but you certainly did find a way to kind of work around it. So that's that's really really cool, man. Um, so um, so so um, this leads me back to another question. So when it comes to content creation, are you is it mostly you and your um, um, partner writing the material, or or, or do you kind of you know do a split, or do you kind of work with like other other writers in the area to develop the content? Yeah, so for now, we do all the writing. We love it. We meet on Skype audio, and I do a little screen share, and we work on final drafts. So it really has been a fun process. You know, if you want to make a feature script from scratch, anyone will tell you it takes months of work. So, you know, it's just all about chipping away at it little by little. But luckily, I have a lot of experience directing. I have a lot of experience with the camera. Joseph directed for Roger Corman, this film Beach Balls. Uh, it's in the box set. It's one of the highest grossing Roger Corman films. And he was also a steady cam focus puller on Pulp Fiction, Starship Troopers, Dracula with Francis Coppola, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, um, I think it was The Return of Freddy, and Star Trek VI, the last one with the original cast. Oh, you know, Nemesis. Yeah, of course, the, you know, the really big films and he was right there doing, you know, the most technical job at the time in the 90s, Steadicam Focus Puller, um, you know, that had just come out. So uh, between us, we have a lot of experience with the camera. We have a lot of experience telling stories. You know, he worked on Independence with John Houston, all that jazz with Bob Fosse. I mean, you know, these are pretty much you know the biggest films of the era and they all took him under his wing and gave him you know a directorial internship you know on gloria as well and starship troopers so you know um i can't say that i've worked on more 200 million dollar projects than he has but together we certainly have uh, one powerful um perspective and, and you know we create stories that we think the audience is really going to respond to so so what kind of stories um or are, are, are you trying to tell are you trying to tell them from you know, i guess from like a horror or science fiction bent or, or or more from like a character driven bent like what like i i i guess the big question is what kind of informs the way that you tell these stories of course you know what stories need to be told and luckily all of our projects have strong leading women protagonists which we really think is important in this era uh, and the studios for a while weren't even interested in pursuing, I think, until Wonder Woman first came out, you know, and then, now you have Barbie making over a billion dollars. So there's so much potential out there for women driven stories. You know, we have a, a whole genre in our company dedicated to horror and another dedicated to action and another you know, dedicated to drama. So we really want you know, people to be satisfied. You know, we think that our stories are compelling and well written. That's what everyone keeps telling us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, because um, because when it comes to storytelling, the big thing, the, the big thing for me is just making sure that this is, you know, that the that the characters are compelling, but what's happening to them is also realistic. You know, that's 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 kind of been a thing that that I've always had and my co-host whenever we review movies he always makes that a sticking point you know it has to be consistent constantly constantly consistent um we did a review of cocaine bear recently and it, it just it just sent a huge argument between the two of us um so 
so I do want to be respectful of uh, of your time just because it's your birthday and we are getting pretty close to the to the Christmas holiday. But um, I do want to ask you, and, and because you're a man who wears many many hats in the industry, and and I seriously tip my hat off to you. Um, what would be the number one hat that that you would wear if you know if if you were compelled by external forces? What would be the number one hat that you would gladly wear, like you know, all the time or or on an, on a regular basis? Wow. I mean, there are no wrong answers, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. No, of course. I mean, you know, the easiest one is to, you know, get the story sold and to really work on other projects, you know, and just be that producer person. But, you know, when the interesting thing is, and, you know, and I hope I come back pretty soon so we can continue the conversation. But oh, we, we, but, we uh, I plan on having you back, man. I, I promise you that. <laughs> excellent. I brought all these little cameras to show, you know, we will. Um, I'm sure we'll have some time soon. So, um, you know, when you're working on set, when you're the director, you know, and, you know, it's day 10 or day 100 or day 200, you know, you're so far removed from that initial, you know, writing session that went on to create this project. So, you know, really as an auteur, I just think it's so much fun to enjoy everything. You know, the electrician or the cameraman, you know, they're not going to know as much about the process as the cinematographer did or the producer or the writer or the director. And, you know, it's just fun for me to, to take a step back and to really think about, you know, why is this going to be a hit? You know, because sometimes you know and sometimes you don't know. Uh, I think Francis Coppola, you know, he did The Godfather. Everyone knew that was going to be a hit. And his rule for The Godfather 2 was he would come back, but no one from the studio was allowed on set because they drove him nuts the whole time doing the first one because they knew it was going to be a hit. So for me, you know, we love the studios. Uh, you know, Sony is obviously, uh, I think, my favorite. But we want uh, everyone to have creative input. Once the story gets sold, you know, it really becomes their product. And, you know, you don't want to do anything that would jeopardize that. So as much fun as it, as it is directing, you know, owning a content development company and selling work, you know, you, you know, that can allow you to make your own projects. And we have so many projects that, uh, you know, we're ready to dive in and direct and to shoot. But you know, right now, um, you know, we really want to focus on the you know high budget, high action, high. Um, I guess the word would be box office, right? We don't want to make small projects uh, as a as a starting point. You know, you really want to hit it big and give the audience something they'll fall in love with, so that when it's time for you to make, you know, your own little fun project, you know, there's no pressure. It's not like man. I spent my life savings on this project. You know, it has to do well. You know, that's not why we make movies. You know, we make movies to to have a lot of fun and to show the world, you know, what can really happen in that little period of time where you're sitting and watching it. You know, there's nothing like for me, you know, watching a film in the theater. You know, I think it's really an incredible experience. So um, I know you said we should wrap it up, but oh, I'm having so much fun. Um, real quick, let's see. I was watching TV the other day. What film came on? Oh, The Shawshank Redemption. Roger Deakins, Tim Robbins, Morgan Freeman. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of my top films of all time to love. So it was a real treat for me to see it on television. And let's see, a television show. That's Oh, Gary Oldman has this show on Apple TV called Slow Horses. I just started watching it. Uh, I this I just finished season three. Oh, I'm very upset that we have to wait a whole <laughs> other period cycle until season four because it really ended with a big cliffhanger. So um, yeah, those are the projects that I, that I've seen recently that I'm really interested in. Excellent, excellent. You actually beat me to the punch on that one. Um, so Simon, um, like I said, I I definitely plan on having having you come back on because there are so many topics to discuss and there are so many things that I, I would love to chat with you but um but for those who are interested in learning more about you or or your work or if they want to just you know follow you where can they do that yeah of course uh my website is brooklynpicturesentertainment.com i have a uh, share grid instagram facebook uh just search me online i'm sure something will come up you can send me an email 
Uh, I also work for a nonprofit, the National Alopecia Areata Foundation. It's my hair loss condition. I've been a community member there for 20 years. So if anyone's watching this, please, uh, you'd like to help me out on my birthday and make a donation. The website is naaf.org. And you can just mention Simon in your donation or something. You know, it doesn't have to be a lot of money, but, you know, it is a great cause. And I'm sure you can check it out and see. Uh, you know, there's a lot of kids who, who don't have the confidence that, you know, we have as filmmakers and, you know, they just need a little extra pep in their step. And, you know, uh, everyone struggles with something, but hair loss as a, a young child is especially hard. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. I mean, it's, 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 one, it's one of those things that you never think about until you actually, you know, either experience it yourself or you see someone go through it and you're like, wow, like, that really does make a huge difference. So um but simon i'm gonna um i i can't thank you enough for taking the time to to being on this podcast and like i said i do plan on having you back for future episodes um and i just want to thank everybody for taking the time to watch this episode and be sure to check out other episodes of the movie pope podcast as well and remember to stay safe take care and simon's got his camera out right there i've seen one of those before actually when i was in film school so they look familiar but um but remember to like comment subscribe and as always thank you so much for watching Catch you on the flip side.